just called them clean. I love it when in the scripture he calls us clean. I like thinking of Jesus referring to me that way since he's been in my heart. He's McLean is my, na- my maiden name. And so I like to say this is McLean Heart. <laughs> and that's important. That's important um, to know who we are in Christ and what a gift of grace that is. Uh, I'm not Kim divorced or Kim who lost her way or Kim who made this mistake or that mistake. I'm Kim McLean Hart. (laughs) So, uh, but thank you, Chad, for reading that passage. And I love this story so much. And I, I, we miss Pastor Sean today. And, and uh, I'm grateful that he uh, invited me to fill in and invites me to fill in when he is not able to be here. And I'm excited about having lived with this this passage this week. Let me get situated and see over this microphone here. The key verses in the passage that uh, Chad just read, I want to highlight uh, a theme from this passage for you this morning. After he had washed their feet, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? If your Lord and teacher, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Do you know what I've done to you? I've wrestled all for a couple of weeks with the title of this message. I almost called it Life in the Express Lane. I almost called it Witness. And I had several other titles that I played around with. And then as the Spirit just worked with my heart and and I listened to Pastor Sean's messages and I know where he's going with his next series and he sent me those notes and said, Lord, what would you what would you say? on this in-between Sunday when we just finished the Good Bone series and we're going into the new series, what would you say to us today? And so I ended up with the title, Unconditional Kindness. Jesus was such a radical, a rebel. Usually when we think of Jesus as the rebel, we imagine him turning over tables in the temple in a fit of rage. We can only imagine how shocking that must have been. Temples were made of stone. These were money-changing tables. There was no red carpeting. There There were no cushioned pews to absorb the loud clanging of coins hitting the floor or the tables crashing against the reverberating rocks. It's one moment in his life that could bewilder us. One display of violent love that defies our sweet image of a harmless and helpless Lamb of God. But when Jesus washes the disciples' feet, my soul breathes a sigh of relief. I want Jesus to be so kind. Yet this action was much more radical than turning over tables could ever be. Fury is such a natural response to injustice. But the humility of touching dirty toes and sun-scorched heels that have walked the dirty streets of Jerusalem all day, sweaty with stress, grimy with soot and sin, How could the king of glory stoop so low? This was a radical thing to do. The story of Jesus washing the feet is only told in John's gospel. The other accounts of the Last Supper don't include the foot washing ceremony. You get the idea that John from John, that the disciples were surprised by Jesus washing their feet. It was disarming. Feet 
are very personal. A foot, touching a foot, is much more intimate than shaking a hand or rubbing an elbow. Maybe it was a custom in ancient Jerusalem, but no less servant-like. Jesus was being a disciple to the disciples. This was Jesus' farewell dinner with his friends. But his friends didn't realize that this was their last supper with him. Just six days before, they'd all been over at Lazarus' house. Probably celebrating Lazarus having just been raised from the dead. His sisters were there, Mary and Martha. Mary had washed Jesus' feet with expensive perfume at that gathering, which, of course, upset you-know-who, Judas. You know what's funny about (laughs) that Lazarus gathering at his house that day is that there were people gathering outside, waiting to get in and kill Lazarus. <laughs> uh, they were angry that he'd been such an example of, of miracle, I guess. I, I don't know. But I've never understood how they figured on keeping Lazarus dead with Jesus right there to raise him up again. You know? And isn't that, has, isn't that how it is with us? The enemy can try to pull you down again and again. But if Jesus is around, and he always is, he's just going to do another miracle and another and another and another. But that's another story. Now it was time for Passover. They'd been observing the festival of Passover their whole lives like their parents and grandparents had done before them. These things are important. It's like the old hymns that we sing now, and they were handed down by our grandparents and our great-grandparents. Eugene Peterson, great theologian who passed away just a couple of years ago, calls this a long obedience in the same direction. And when we're faithful week after week to worship together, and be witnesses of life with God together. We are participating in a long obedience in the same direction. Christians today don't observe Passover, but it's part of our heritage. Passover is an ancient Jewish tradition commemorating the liberation of the Jews from their captivity in Egypt. The word Passover reminds us of the story of Moses and the Israelites. They were slaves to Egypt, but God sent Moses to lead them to freedom with a little, okay, a lot of help from God. As the story goes, a plague came over Egypt, but God told the Israelites to do what to do so that they wouldn't die during this plague. He told them to put the blood of a lamb on the doorposts of their homes so that the plague in Egypt would pass them by. It's in Exodus chapter 12. I don't know if you have your Bibles, but I'll show you just a snippet of it. You can even look it up on your phone, and we won't think you're FaceTiming. Exodus chapter 12. And this is fascinating to see and to put this into context, because this was the first Passover that ever happened. And so then... Uh, centuries later, when Jesus was born and he's having this Passover dinner at his Last Supper, he's still obeying this thing that the Lord had instructed them, this tradition that the Lord had set up for them to do. Because these things are important. And the Lord said, verse 1, And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the 10th of the month they are to take a lamb for each family, 
a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat it. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Your lamb shall be without blemish. A year old male. It may, you may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You may keep it until the 14th day of the month, and then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they eat. And so he goes on to describe this. But that's, what, that's how the festival of the Passover got started. So the plague would pass over their houses when the blood of the lamb, the unblemished lamb, was on the doorpost. So that's where that story comes from, and that's the thread of, of the story that we are a part of. Jesus knew that he was that lamb now. Our Passover lamb is Jesus himself. It's sin that passes over us now. The plague of sin. Those attitudes and habits in our lives that separate us from God and each other. When you welcome Christ into your life, the blood of Jesus is on the doorpost of your heart so that sin will pass you by. And when sin passes you by, you begin to desire the things of God more than the dark things that ruin your life and the lives of others. It's good to take that in. I hear a lot of people when I teach, when I teach Bible studies and when I'm just out and about and who are kind of afraid of this Old Testament, like, yeah, that's old, right? And, of course, in this Nazarene denomination, we're taught the whole Bible and we're taught the whole story. And you nod when you hear the story of the Passover because, you, yes, I've known that since I was a child. Yes, I've known. But everybody hasn't. So everybody doesn't know what on earth we're talking about. And it's good to know those links and where it started and how those stories began and, and why God set these things in motion as symbols for us to really be able to stay locked in and to communicate these stories and these great truths it all was born through storytelling. Because you can hear more truth in a story told than if, I, if, if you, sometimes if you try to slam people with it, you can tell it in a story. And it's a beautiful story. You know, my, my daughter lived in Ethiopia for a little while, the one whose birthday is tomorrow, my little ladybug. That's my nickname for her. Her name is Danielle Nicole just like our Danielle, who's usually sup sitting up in the balcony, but I don't see her today. And when she lived in Ethiopia for that year, she and her husband, uh, it was fascinating. She was, she, we would get to talk occasionally when she would call home, and they would, she went over to some friend's house. She called, she said, Mom, <laughs> they have invited us over to a grill out, and they brought in, like, the chicken and they killed it in front of us. <laughs> and they, you know, like cleaned it and they, like they started from scratch. To <laughs> from literally, <laughs> she, she said it was so gross. I feel like I couldn't eat. <laughs> and it's very archaic. Like this, is, this happens in places in this world now. So this passage in, uh, that seems so odd to us, you know, God says bring in this lamb and, and slaughter it. And then we want to have you would have a meal with it. And much of our biblical, many of our biblical stories actually take place in Ethiopia. You know, that's a real biblical area. But it's a third world country today. She lived in Addis Ababa. And very archaic. And so I said, oh, you're getting a real firsthand experience of what these stories in the Old Testament are like. <laughs> so it doesn't seem so old, but it symbolizes. It symbolizes that community. And get your very best lamb. And it symbolizes things in that community and it unifies them together well at the Passover meal that day Jesus knew that he would be betrayed soon and he knew that he would die soon at some point during the meal 
Maybe that maybe they just finished eating. But you almost get the idea that he got up right in the middle of his kosher meal, half eaten. And he gets up and he removes his outer robe and he ties a towel around his hips. And he pours clean water into a basin and starts washing their feet, one person at a time. And when he removes his robe, I always think about the symbolism, the symbolism of that and how he maybe was removing a layer of guarded hospitality. You know how we walk into church polite, because we should, <laughs> with guarded hospitality, but this was a time of authenticity and vulnerability where he was going to say, this is who I am. I'm going to show you the savior of Philippians chapter two that Paul would recognize in the spirit later because God gave him a revelation of who Jesus was in his life. And he said, the son of God, the very king of glory emptied himself to take on human form, to walk in our shoes, to be a disciple to the disciples. And so he takes off his robe, almost representing like he's taking off a kingly robe. Many churches today still have old-fashioned foot washings. And every time I get to preach, I almost always mention that field out there that we always talk about as we come by it. Because that was the first foot washing here at Faith Community that I'd been to in about 100 years. <laughs> out there on that lawn. And Landra, I had invited Landra, to my friend Landra, to that Event and it was the first foot washing she'd done, been part of. And, and every time we're around that corner, she'll say, There's the foot washing field. It's always so pretty and mowed. And it was so special. There's something about it. And we had we would have foot washings at our uh at our church to as an act of humble discipleship. It can be a little awkward and uncomfortable for both the foot washer and the one whose feet get washed. I remember as a 13-year-old girl when our, our church had foot washings every fifth Sunday. And the, uh, the ladies and the men were in separate rooms for this. And the ladies washed the ladies' feet and the men washed the men's feet. And I thought it was gross. <laughs> and my feet were so ticklish and unbearable to have them touched. And so this was a really excruciating symbol for, <laughs> for me. But looking back, I'm glad for the... Uh, for this identification that it made with this passage in John. Recently, a modern-day version of this story happened around me. It didn't involve feet. But it did involve humility and the express lane of a grocery store, which is why this sermon almost got m named Life in the Express Lane. A friend told me about working in the express lane at the grocery store where, the, uh, where she's a clerk. And if you've never done that job, you don't realize how telling it is of how impatient our culture has become. And rude. There are rules for the express lane. Ways to do things. Just like there are ways to have that Passover meal. Just like everybody says, oh, religion's all about the rules. Well, there's a reason for that. The rules for the express lane, people might not like rules much, but here's the deal. It's 10 items or less as a courtesy. And it only works if everyone cooperates. My friend told me about a man who came to her express lane with an overloaded carton full of groceries. You know, like one of those $300 kind of. And she said, sir, I can't take you in this lane. And he was angry. And he said, you have no customers right now. And he called her lazy and another name that I can't say in church. And she said, sir, I could lose my job if I checked you out. And he cursed her. Meanwhile... Customers with 10 items or less began to pile up behind him because sure enough, if she takes a big order during a, small, during a slow moment, the line fills back up with the obedient customers. And then they have to wait because of the stubborn one. But you know what? My heart broke for my friend 
Because I don't care whether it's a stranger on the highway or a stranger in the grocery store. When somebody calls me an ugly name, it hurts my heart. Because we're children of God and we're not to be talked to that way. None of us. And my heart broke for my friend having to endure such rudeness. And she said, well, it happens every time I'm on the express lane register. She didn't seem to hold a grudge about it. She, she told it like it, it's just the way people are. She told it like it made her feel sad inside. But I was stunned and appalled at this guy's behavior, cussing out a stranger who was only doing her job. When did everyone become so entitled? And what happened to the servant's heart? And why is the world so mean? I can't seem to get used to it. And I hope I never do. Attitudes are like dominoes. We tend to align right up with each other with our moods, with our words, with our actions. And with one little tap, there's a chain reaction. When we are unkind, there is a chain reaction around us. And when we are kind and loving, there is a chain reaction around us. At my high school graduation the other day, <laughs> about nine years ago, <laughs> don't laugh that hard, someone prayed the prayer of St. Francis, which was the first time I'd ever heard it. Prayer had been removed from public schools, but I guess they were able to reference it like great literature because that's what it is. I was floored. It was so beautiful. I'd never heard anything quite like it. I was 18 years old sitting there in my little cap and grant gown listening to them. They described how I wanted to live and be. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me show love. Where there is injury, let me show forgiveness. And then someone got up and, and told a modern day parable at that same graduation about a man, I've never forgotten it, about a man who had a rough day at work. His boss was in a bad mood and it chewed him out. So he comes home in a terrible mood and he feels entitled to it. His day was hard. He works hard for his family. Life is hard. So he expressed his hard feelings. Forget about gratitude for having a great family to come home to. His wife greets him with a hug and a smile, but he's dark and gruff, and he snaps at her. And her feelings are hurt, and her mood changes. Their son comes downstairs and asks for help with his homework, and she snaps at him. Can't he see she's busy getting supper ready? Dad is hungry, and he's worked hard all day. And she works hard, too. And the boy's mood changes. And he feels like he doesn't matter very much. And he's angry. They want him to make A's, but they won't help him with his homework. He goes back to his room, and his cat steps in his path to greet him as he walks in. And in anger and frustration, he kicks the cat. Poor cat. And she's thinking, well, what did I do? Bad attitudes have a domino effect, but they also create deeper consequences than we may realize, which is what Pastor Sean's been teaching on lately. Entitlement leads to blame. And blame leaves you living less than God's best for you. We start in with phrases like, my life would be better if, or I couldn't be impeccable with my word because. You can fill in the blank a thousand ways with a thousand reasons not to be content with your own life and within your own circumstances. It's so easy to cast our stories as being, well, I'm not as bad as that guy. We measure our lives against extreme cases, and it sets us up for compromise. No one owes us a happy, convenient life. Joy is not contingent upon circumstances. It's only born from deep within. Psalm 46 says, be still and know that I am God. 
And God promises that if we draw near to him, he himself will be our heart's reward. All of us are free to know this at any given moment. And I promise that it can turn your life around, even if you've been a cat kicker in the past. But it's also reassuring if you've been the cat. People who are unkind toward you are not the measure of your character and the dignity and respect that you deserve. Sometimes I think the whole world could use a good foot washing. What I mean by that is we need more humble acts of kindness. When I think about that Last Supper Passover meal and Jesus washing those feet in that upper room that day, I'm always amused by Peter's reaction. Peter wants Jesus to wash more than just his feet. He asks the Lord to wash his whole being. Lord, not just my feet, all of me. And I think of that as the first sanctification prayer. Sanctify me through and through. 1 Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. God himself will sanctify you through and through. And I always wonder if Jesus then went back over and filled the water basin with some more clean water again and just dumped it on Peter's head. The Bible doesn't say that he did, but it sounds to me like something Jesus would do because a good minister never passes up a chance at a baptism. I got to be the pastor that baptized Chris and Daniel in the river. It is a really a life moment that I treasure as a minister and a friend. But the big shocker of the story is that Jesus washed Judas's feet, knowing that Judas would be the catalyst leading Jesus to his death. The scripture makes it clear that Jesus knew. He always knows. But he washed Jesus, he washed Judas's feet, and then he died for Judas's sins. Unconditional kindness. God loves us all with unconditional kindness. I find this at church. I see witness after witness of this very thing. The church and the church people interacting out in the world are witnesses of God's unconditional kindness to the world. Love seems like such a big idea, but it's so simple. It's Emily's banana bread. It's Toby's happy little grin in the nursery. It's our prayer list. It's Nita's prayer. It's Chad's reading. It's Walter's Sunday school class and Pastor Sean's messages and our music and the board's time volunteered to guide this church with wisdom and accountability. It's Anita and the kids and Marsha and Selena and Allison with everything. It's Michael's story about how this whole church came and sat in the emergency room when his son was sick. I love it when he tells me that story. He says it with tears in his eyes every time. My whole church was there for me, Miss Kim. I could go on and on, and I don't want to leave anybody out, but I hope you all know what a difference you make in my life and in so many lives. The Bible makes it simple to understand because love is simple. The Bible does a lot more showing than telling when it comes to love. Jesus talking to outcast, the good Samaritan stopping to help a stranger. Paul's reminder that when we help the needy, we may be entertaining angels and don't even know it. James's statement that true religion is to help the widows and the poor. And it goes beyond that. Loving the homeless with a buck or a meal feels much easier than loving a person with hidden agendas or the rude guy in the express line who's cussing you out for no good reason than his own misery. I'm not saying we should invite that guy over for dinner necessarily, although inviting him to church might be a good idea. I'm just asking us to give him and people like that space in our hearts in hope that they will find their way back to the love they were created to be. It's not really about who you like or who doesn't irritate you or who can get you ahead in your career. It's about everybody. He's got the whole world in his hands. 
because he loves the whole world. Near the end of John 13, Jesus gives a new commandment. He tells them to love one another as he has loved them. He said everybody would know they were his disciples by the love they showed. And he said the Holy Spirit would empower them to do this. Isn't it interesting that we need a power greater than ourselves to be able to love one another when love is so simple and we need it so much? Fear is complicated, but we fall into patterns of fear so easily. Afraid of what others will think of us. Afraid of what others will do to us. Afraid we'll lose out, lose sleep, lose hope. And before you know it, we're trying everything but love in order to feel better to get by when loving God and ourselves and others is the only therapy that really works. Jesus described loving action as fruit in John 15, 1 through 12. And in that passage, he says, I am the vine and you are the branches. And if you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask what you will and it shall be done to you. It's beautiful. And I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you with some homework to go home today and read sometime before this day is over. John 15 verses 1 through 12 about abiding in the vine and think on these things. And there, he says, it's not a new commandment and that you love one another. He said, I'm giving you a new, he doesn't say it's not a, he says, I'm giving you a new commandment that you love one another as I've loved you. And I don't know why he keeps calling it new because he says it over and over. <laughs> love one another and show the world what love looks like as though they didn't learn that in kindergarten. It amounts to be nice, play nice, and play well with others. But we grown-ups need the added reminder to be nice for the right reasons because it's an inside-out thing, not just being nice to get ahead, but even that's a good start. <laughs> it occurred to me that I don't hear the word abide very much anymore. Jesus said to abide in the vine, which is to abide in him. To abide is to accept, to act in accordance with a standard. To abide is to stay in a place, to persist. It is long obedience in the same direction. Jesus described a vine with fruit on it. Paul describes the fruit that grows from God's love and the power at work in us in some detail. We call it the fruit of the Spirit. And where it really shows is in the express lanes of your life. One of the fruits is patience. One is goodness. Another, self-control. Another, peace. Another, joy. And of course, the one I keep talking about, kindness. Sometimes lately, it seems that kindness is a fruit that just doesn't grow well in today's soil. It's an easy one to excuse away with phrases that sound so responsible. Hey, business is just business. Or, well, don't take it personally. Kind people in this culture seem endearing and weak. But thinking of my friend in that express lane, or thinking of that guy who yells at his wife, who snaps at her son, who kicks the cat, I realize how far a little unkindness goes. It's like poison in the living water. Our key verse this morning was John 13, 12 through 15. After he'd washed their feet, he said to them, Do you know what I've done to you? If I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought also to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you should do as I have done to you. Do you know what I've done to you? Jesus asked. What a strange way to say it. Do you know what I've done to you? The question for me hints at something that has been done to me that can't be undone. Once you see a thing, you can't unsee it. Once you know a thing, you can't unknow it. Once you say a thing, you can't unsay it. 
no take backs. We are forever changed with the slightest glimpse of Jesus and the power of God's work in us and in this world. You see, Jesus didn't wash the feet of the nice ones. He showed unconditional kindness, unconditional kindness, because our God is slow to anger and rich in mercy. It says that a million times in the Bible. I should actually look it up and count how many. That means if someone cuts us off in traffic, if we don't respond, that we do not respond with vengeful thoughts like, you know, stupid jerk. See, the miracle of grace is that you can offer even the least of these unconditional kindness, even in the privacy of your own heart, especially in the privacy of your own heart. Because what you think of others is what you think of yourself. And how you treat others is how you treat yourself. And you can flip it around. How you treat yourself in your own head is how you treat others. But I realized another thing. We're not called to perfect one fruit at a time. We're not trying to perfect the fruit, the fruit of love and joy and peace and goodness, faithfulness, temperance and kindness at all. These things are simply evidence of God's presence. Seek first the kingdom of God and these things will be added unto you. And as these fruits grow from the good soil of your heart, they will be available to all the people in your life. And it will create a domino effect. An apple tree doesn't cringe if a bad man comes by to pluck it for a snack. The apple just grows unconditionally. The fruit we bear, this light we carry, this salt that we are, it doesn't play favorites because God doesn't play favorites. Just before I call the praise team back up in just a moment, sometimes it feels like when you're up here and you're talking to the church, you're saying things that everyone already knows. In fact, I'm always glad when I get up here and I realize that I'm saying things that you already know. Because I'm with a cloud of witnesses. And I love loving God together with you. It makes a difference when we show up here. We don't show up for Pastor Sean. We don't show up for the music. We show up for God and for each other. We don't show up to become better people. We show up because we are God's <laughs> children. Pastor Sean's been preaching a series called Good Bones for the past month and how the inside is affects how the outside looks. And this is what got me thinking about all this. Jesus said, what is abundantly in our hearts is what others see. God is at work in us, in you, in me, to do abundantly more than we could ask or imagine. That's Ephesians 3.20. And that's a promise. So if there's any place in your heart, any hidden corner, any attitude, hurt, regret, that you need to lay down at his feet, you can always bring it to the altar at any time. This altar the altar in the quiet prayer of a quiet prayer in your room at home. Praying in your car on the way to work, or on the way home from church. The altar of your life. Pray that we would lay it all down today and that the Lord, even though we know these things, would keep us loving the world as much as he loves it no matter what we see. Nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is impossible with God. No fear, no habit, no story, no broken bones. Nothing 
is impossible for God. I pray that God's will be done in our lives on earth as it is in heaven. We may feel helpless sometimes in the face of the world's overwhelming troubles, but I promise you every small act of grace you offer makes a difference. May the bitterness and strife and fear that is in this world right now pass over you today and every day as you live in the flowing, in the loving, abiding presence of God. May the brokenness of others that hurts you, insults you, or tries to tear you down pass over you today and every day as you live in the loving, abiding presence of God. May anger, regret, shame pass over you today and every day as you live in the loving, abiding presence of God. And may fear pass over you today and every day as you live in the loving, abiding presence of God. May the Spirit of God descend on you like a dove today and every day so that you are free to see love everywhere, to be love everywhere, with all the power of a son and daughter of the Most High God. Would you stand and let's pray and sing a closing song? Would you bow your heads in prayer? Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light, and where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I might not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. And it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Mm -hmm.